We have an attorney on who was big with the DNC. He also went down to Florida and really kicked butt for the Gore campaign. And this is Jack Young. So, Jack, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate this. Rob, it's my pleasure. All right. So, Jack, you know, can you bring the viewers back? Because most of the audience that listen to this are male, but they're mostly millennials and they're very progressive people. Can you bring them back to November 7th of 2000 and waking up and going through the day? What happened? Bring us back to that day. Let me, well, let me take you back to um, moments before uh, November. We had a contested election um, that was very, um, very close even during the campaigns. Uh, we had by 2000, it had become obvious that candidates to win the presidency had to focus on target states. Right. Both the Bush and the Gore people uh, picked their target, targeted states. Well, on election night, those targets came back to haunt actually both parties. Um, New Mexico, which Bush thought he might be able to win, was going to go for Gore. Florida was not a targeted state for Al Gore because he thought he was going to win his home state of Tennessee, which he didn't. He got very close. He was a couple votes short on the Electoral College when we got the results from New Hampshire. New Hampshire, New England, usually Democratic. That would have brought Al Gore over the top at 270 electoral votes. However, New Hampshire split between Al Gore and Ralph Nader, went to, went to Governor Bush. By doing that, it left Al Gore short barely short of the 270 electoral votes right. necessary to, to, to win the Electoral College. And as everyone knows, it's, in our country, elections for president are for the Electoral College. You can win the popular vote. If you lose the Electoral College, you lose. And we've seen that in, the, in subsequent elections where uh, Trump could lose the, lose the popular vote, but win the electoral vote. Same thing happened. Uh, with uh, Bill Clinton, didn't get the, the majority vote, but won the Electoral College. Well, here, it's election night, November 2000. New Hampshire has, has split between Ralph Nader and Al Gore. So what Bush picks up those three electoral votes. So it all comes down to Florida. Florida is not a particularly targeted state for the vice president, but it's tight. The next day, we take um, uh, Joe Lieberman's plane. Um, he didn't need it anymore. He, he had finished campaigning, obviously. We took it with a team of election uh, lawyers and enthusiastic kids to Tampa to start the electoral recount process. One of our big initial decisions is how to approach uh, the state. Uh, neither neither party had a, had very strong presidential campaigns. Uh, since Al Gore didn't need Florida, the Democratic political structure was not uh, top notch. It had some great people, but we hadn't dedicated a lot of time and money to it. Our first decision is how is this going to work? And in Florida, each of the 67 counties act almost independently. There is no um, real cohesiveness with how counties are going to approach a recount. And there's two kind of recounts. There's the mechanical one that's done uh, if, it, if a reflection is close. And then there is the hand count, which we'll talk about in a little bit. With each county having its own decision-making power, our first question was, how do we approach this? Do we do a statewide recount, which I was totally in favor for, or do we pick 
big counties, and they were counties that were democratic, for taking a statewide approach. The argument is that you find votes in all sorts of counties and cities where, while the county may be Republican, you still have pockets of Democratic voters. Uh, and a good, um, a good example is Duval County. Mm. Republican, it's Jacksonville, but go south and you'll pick up uh, a series of Democratic areas. So the state recount versus now picking big Democratic counties. And the, the four were then Volusia, Palm Beach, which is, which in the Broward and then Miami Dade. The the argument for doing just those four counties was that we were behind, but we weren't behind by a lot. That if we did recounts quickly in those four counties, we could get ahead, and the rules on recounts are pretty simple. If you're behind, you want to expand the recount to almost everything that, that you can think of. You want to throw the kitchen sink at it because you're looking for votes. If you're ahead, which the Bush people were, you want to constrain it because you won on election night. So why do you want to go mess with that win? Why do you want to open it up? The the process became uh, the problem, particularly for Gore. Uh, we started in those four counties. Uh, we did extremely well in Volusia County. Uh, that was a um, optical scan county. That's where you fill in the bubbles. Uh, we picked up 98 votes. Uh, I'm kind of proud that, that the way we did it in Volusia County was business-like, organized, the board was responsive. Uh, the chief judge um, didn't put up with any nonsense. We actually had some protesters and he moved um, uh, a block away from the courthouse where the recount was being held. And that bit will become important when we talk about Miami and the Brooks Brothers riot. Um, because there the board allowed the protesters not only into the building, but into the, to ver the very area where the recount was going forward. And it may have been one of the reasons why the Miami recount was concluded uh, without finishing the, the actual recount of the votes. In um, Broward County, we had a fairly successful effort of following a, a process where we would record not only all the votes, Bush versus Gore, but look at the characteristics. Was it, and those were punch card counties, what was the punch card look like? Was it a, was it a deep uh, indentation? Was it fully punched out? What characteristic did you see and who did that go for? Why this becomes important is there really wasn't a standard for counting punch cards. Right. So you had things like the, 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 little, the little square that you punched out. If it went all the way through, the machine clearly picked it up. If, it, if you only punched out two corners, then you had like a swinging door. And that swinging door, if you recount it, can either flip up or flip down. So in a punch card recount, you always get a, a change uh, in the vote. But you wanna, you wanna characterize what those are because it tells you what kind of standards you wanna argue for. If, if swinging doors are going more your way, you wanna believe that swinging doors is something beneficial to you. If they're not going your way, you, you wanna try to minimize uh, their use. And we had a, a very smart uh, guy there, and Chris Sodder, who had written a, a, a small uh, book 
uh, with another guy, Tim Downs, who's now deceased, uh, on um, the recount primer that basically went through these rules. But you have to you have to be careful because you have to you have to develop the standards kind of on the fly. There's nothing wrong with that. We we in America have kind of two ways of of doing election and regulatory standards. One, the agency publishes ahead of time and says, "Here's the here's our standards," which we now do, um, and did in fact in the 2018 recount in Florida. Right. Or you can develop the standards as you look at cases. You basically, the standards are derived from adjudication, adjudicatory standards. And you see that a lot in mass um, uh, general court matters. For example, traffic cases. You, you can figure out the standard. If you ever go to court, do not be the first person uh, in a traffic ticket. Um, to present yourself to the judge, ask to be passed, whatever, because what you want to do is you want to watch what the judge is doing. And if the judge starts saying, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to let you off a little old lady because you did X. Well, you want to, you want to be the, the, not even the next, but the next, the next person that stands up as your honor, I, I did X. And the judge will see the consistency if you're up there first, you, you're just swinging, you're swinging for the fences without an idea uh, where the home run is. The same in elections. You want to try to develop a standard and you what standard benefits your client. Now, after all of the debates about pregnant Chad, which are Chad that are just pushed down and they're pushed down either because the person didn't push hard enough or the machines hadn't been um, maintained, so they were fill, uh, filled with Chad from, from earlier elections. And there's a big controversy about whether it's Chad, both singular and plural, or whether it's Chad's. Uh, I am of this, the traditional school that Chad is both plural uh, and uh, singular, so it's Chad. But so there'd be a whole bunch of Chad uh, backed up in the in the machine, so that if you push down, well, you're trying to push against a carpet almost of of, of Chad from other elections. <coughs> so the the thing that you wanted to do mm-hmm. was then to try to figure out quickly what the standard was going to be. We we did that in uh, Volusia in an optical scan. Chris Sauter did that in Brower County. Miami um, didn't get started early, partially because of political factors. Uh, it is alleged that the mayor at the time didn't get necessarily get along with Al Gore. Um, some of this might be because of the administration's um, efforts in the Elion case. Right. Um, um, that might have been a factor. Um, the board was slow to organize. Um, it's only three people. Uh, so Miami wasn't going anywhere. And then Palm Beach became the epicenter of everything that could go wrong, went wrong. Uh, one, there were, there were early protests. Um, there was also the case of the so-called butterfly ballot. And this is a ballot that when you looked at it, it was confusing as to where you were supposed to punch out uh, the ticket for for Al Gore, Joe Lieberman, versus other candidates. And in an attempt to help seniors, and this is where unintended consequences come back to haunt you, the board had increased the size of the print so that they could get all of the electors and I think there were some dozen on facing pages. So that you didn't have to go to the next, you didn't have to turn the book over to the next page. Smart thing to do, trying to help seniors. There was also um, a legend that's supposed to be on most machines that said, you know, vote every page. Right. Well, if it flips over the so-called caterpillar ballot, um, this, this shows you 
that press and politicians, given enough time and probably enough alcohol, come up with interesting names at best. Um, so try to fix it. But by fixing it, it would became difficult to determine where you were supposed to punch the ballot for mm. Gore, Al Lieberman versus Pat Buchanan. Right. Well, some 6,000 people in Palm Beach vote for Pat Buchanan. Now, well, without trying to be particularly characteristic about what a voting population looks like, because every population has everyone in it, you would have thought that Palm Beach would have gone for Joe Lieberman, if nothing else. Um, forget about Al Gore for a second. And remember, you're voting for electors for Al Gore and Joe Lieberman. 6,000 people vote for Pat Buchanan. And even Pat Buchanan uh, said right. that he didn't believe those votes. And Pat Buchanan, very conservative, uh, had raised some real questions about the Holocaust at one point. Yeah. Um, so you knew that population wasn't going for Pat Buchanan. Here's the problem. There's no way to fix that. Uh, the, the, the fix should have been, uh, particularly for Democratic operatives in Florida, to have looked at that ballot before the election and said, no, this isn't going to work. This is too confusing. And we saw that again in, two, in 2018 in the Senate race where in the same county, the United States Senate race was, was underneath the instructions. So you could miss the Senate race. And there's an argument that had that not been confusing, in either case, the Democratic candidate would have won. The lesson there is political parties, candidates have to look at the ballots before the election. Because there's no way to fix it. How are you, how are you um, going to determine who those six thousand uh, folks were? Now, it's interesting because people did in Florida in the Democratic world know of the problem early. Uh, on election day, um, I'll make up the names, but Brad and Ethel Rosenberg coming out of the polling place. Brad says Ethel, I think I made a mistake. I think I voted for Pat Buchanan. Well, that that circulates in the morning, and those names are fictitious, but it circulates in the morning, and here's what could have happened. Assume, and again, remember for Al Gore, Florida's not on his targeted list, doesn't need it to win, he says. Um, we've got a problem. How are we going to fix it? We can't change the ballot. What are we going to do? And here is the difference and the advertisement, I guess. Had someone in the Democratic Party in Florida, in Palm Beach, gone to Kinko's and made thousands of sample ballots that looked like that page, circled it with a Sharpie, um, and said, punch, I think it's four, punch four for Gore, or maybe it's five, punch, punch four for Gore and Lieberman, and pass those out, enough voters would not have been confused that Al Gore would be president. So my yeah. question is, is that, you know, I know Al Gore, you said that he didn't have a huge campaign staff down there. But my question is, he did do one of his last rallies. I remember watching this with Stevie Wonder and Ben Affleck was there. Um, and obviously, Florida is a huge state at that time. I think it was 25 electoral votes. Now mm -hmm. it's 29. Right. So my question is, is why do you feel like somebody from the Florida Democratic Party or even the Palm Beach Democratic Party or this, this whole uh, canvassing board in Palm Beach was a Democratic, it was fully Democrat. Why didn't anybody step up and see this? I, I know you, you're not on any of those boards, but why do you feel you were in the thick of things? Um, I think it's just a lack of attention, a lack of attention to detail. Um, the, the 
problem was not faced creatively. Or my answer, my answer would have been, we're gonna crank up at the sample ballots. And how this would have been this easy. Someone from the party, someone from even the national party, if it had, if it had clearly known what was going on, and it might have, um, says to a couple of Kinko uh, stores, I'm, I'm going to give you a credit card number. You have a nice day because you're going to crank out thousands and thousands of sample ballots, run it up on the credit card. I don't care what it costs. We're going to have runners pick them up um, as you crank them out of the machines. We're going to make copies after copies all day. And we'll have people running in, running out, picking up whatever you've printed. At the end of the day, you go buy yourself a boat and Al Gore is president. It's that simple. Um, and one of the things we have seen following um, 2000 is the beginning of building a promote, the, promote and protect the vote, um, sometimes by the unions, election protection, to do that, to say there's a problem in such and such a county, let's, uh, let's, let's get on it now and let's have a creative, responsive answer. Now, I think what happened is everyone said, yeah, the, the butterfly ballot may be confusing. I can't do anything about it because the ballot's already printed uh, and being used. Well, that's not the answer. The answer is whatever you see an electoral problem with a ballot. And we saw it in 2018 again. Right. Uh, the party, the candidates have to be responsive to the needs of the people. Uh, we don't do uh, retail campaigning anymore. You know, we, we, we don't deliver groceries anymore. We hadn't before the pandemic. We don't deliver the mail very often. And, and no one delivers votes. And no one works a precinct. So no one's actually talking to voters. Had that happened, uh, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have captured all of the... the the misspent votes to Buchanan, but maybe we pick up half of them. Let's say we pick up 3,000. Well, in the election, we come down to the difference between Al Gore and Governor Bush being 537. Right. Um, and you don't, have to, you don't have to have a college degree to figure out that 3,000 is more than 537, right. <laughs> particularly if you're going to own your own home. So the, the, the process um, then as it's moving forward, going, it concludes it's timely, smartly um, in Volusia. It's going well in Broward. Miami-Dade is slow to get started. And then the recount in Palm Beach becomes a disaster. It's a disaster because we have influence from uh, Harris, the Secretary of State, sending people in. We have an electoral board that is not strong on management. Mm -hmm. Judge Burton is confused at times to, to, to be kind um, about his role. I mean, he's a smart guy, he's a good judge, but this is not something that he does every day. So we had a hard time trying to figure out how to manage. And then the two sides get into one of the most ridiculous fights of all time. Mm. And that is a ballot looks like this for Bush. The Al Gore people object to it. The very next ballot comes up, it looks like this. It's for Al Gore. It's the same as the ballot we just looked at. The Bush people object. And so they take those ballots and set them aside. They're contested ballots now. And that goes on for the whole process. The problem with that is that as you look at ballots, you wanna see what, what is happening in the majority of them. What is, what is the characteristics that best get you where you wanna be? That is, have votes for your candidate. So in my example, I look at that ballot. If I'm an Al Gore person, I look at it and rather than just say, I object, you look at it and say, wait a minute. I've, I know already I've got a handful of ballots look just like that. 
Right. I'll agree. Yeah. The next That's ballot comes up. It's the Al Gore ballot. Now, if even if the if the Bush people object, it's pretty obvious that the board says no. You counted it this way. We're going to count it that way. That actually happened in Volusia early, uh, where we were able to take advantage of the Republican reaction and agreed early to a series of ballots. We said, yeah, those are those are Bush ballots. I got so vehemently criticized for doing that early, uh, giving away ballots. Um, I think I was actually fired a couple of times. Fortunately, the people who were firing me were in Tallahassee. Um, and I either uh, didn't answer the phone or I threw it one time across the parking lot. <laughs> Nothing happened. The same night I dropped my phone in the hotel uh, on the floor at a carpeted hotel in, in Deland. That was a special treat anyway, a carpet in Deland in a hotel and the whole phone blew up. Um, but what you wanted to do is to, is to see what the process is. And this whole back and forth in Palm Beach come, will come back to haunt us again when we have the trial uh, and, and the question about the proof. Well, we could say in Volusia, we have 98 uh, net votes for Al Gore. Right. In Broward, we have, I can't remember the number now, 300 and something net votes for Al Gore. So right there, we have close to 400 votes. The difference is now 537. We're going to pick up some votes in Miami-Dade. We have 80 net votes for, for Gore there, even though it's not complete. Um, and now the question is, what do, what's, what's the answer in um, Palm Beach? Mm. And, the, and the best that David Boys could do uh, with his team is to say, well, we, we put those contested ballots in evidence. Right. Well, fine. So what? What do they tell you? Not that those that had been finally certified, but if it, we'd been able to say, and we have 537 net votes for Al Gore from Palm Beach, that would make things quite different. Well, we didn't um, because this tracking is very important because it sometimes is a little counterintuitive. In some examples, and I believe this would have been true in Miami-Dade, had they actually completed vote, is the standard that made the best sense was kind of a middle standard. We didn't have to go to these pregnant Chad and, and all this other stuff. If we just stuck in the middle, Al Gore was picking up votes. And we knew that because we would, after every precinct was done, we would have written down what the characteristics were, what we would know, put on these big spreadsheets. You can do it by hand as, as Chris Sauter does, um, or you can put them on a computer spreadsheet, which I do. And so you start looking at it and say, hey, here's, the, here's exactly the standard that applies. Mm -hmm. It's a little like our traffic case. If you sit in the back of the room and you look at it long enough, you say, I see the adjudicative standard evolving. But Jack, yeah. do you feel like this was always kind of be going to be tough? It could have been a lost cause. You know, we followed the election. Uh, the Republicans went right to federal court just on their way to the Supreme. Obviously, that was going to take some time. They had all the protesters mm -hmm. in the streets. You talked a little bit about the Brooks Barlow's riot. We haven't really fully got into it. Yeah. But, you know, Jeb had control of the state. Harris was the chair of the Bush Cheney campaign. You know, also the, all the law firms in the state were kind of not going to, you know, bash Jeb. So they weren't right. even going to get involved. So it was always going to be a tough case in with the ballots, too. Oh, abso well, absolutely. It was, we, remember, we were behind. And when I say we, Al Gore was behind from the get go. Yeah. Uh, now, no one early, uh, uh, maybe other than Ted Olson, who's an extremely bright guy, uh, a friend of mine. Um, figured out early that the Supreme Court might actually take a, an equal protection case. And that's what this started to become because it was, it was one that, that there was, since there was no kind of standard right. uh, and there wasn't a, an evolving kind of control of the 
the the message. And remember, Al Gore's message is confusing to say the least. Right. Um, he says, count every vote. Oh, but we're only going to count them in the four counties we're doing right now. And they used that against you guys, too. <clears throat> they did. Um, I I was against that theory. Right. Um, but um, I do recognize why uh, the politicos and why the vice president <clears throat> uh, uh, went down that road. It's not a totally irresponsible approach. It's just one that's incomplete. The idea was if if Al Gore could get ahead, then the New York Times and everyone would would gather around the Al Gore side of the ledger, that there'd be some kind of PR breakthrough. I don't think that's how recounts work. Uh, I always think that you can pick up votes uh, in odd places. Um, some of the times voting is, um, is confusing to certain populations. You look at those populations and say, okay, um, they could be uh, in all sorts of counties. Right. Um, and again, the Duval County is a good example. Right. The Southern part, we could have picked up votes. When it came down to it, 537 votes is a lot, but in, in that recount is possible, is doable. So we have Volusia's complete. We have Broward is on the right track. Palm Beach is just a Donnybrook. And now we get to Miami-Dade, uh, the politics are odd. Miami-Dade, in, in the Politico's wild-eyed uh, predictions, which were wrong, uh, was a Democratic um, district that we should do well in a recount. What wasn't taken into consideration, we saw, we saw it in the last election, um, was wow. that, that you can't, that particularly after Ellen, uh, the Cuban population is not democratic. Uh, it's not cohesive. Uh, that we're going to see ups and downs. We'll start with, with Avion and we'll start with the senior part of the Gold Coast. We'll do well there. Right. We're going to lose. We're going to lose when we get to um, precincts in the city and we'll pick up a little bit. And we'll, we'll probably come out of Miami-Dade with somewhere between 80 and 100 votes. Uh, now we had we had some experts that um, uh, I can't tell you how they figured this out. Thought that we'd get thousands of votes, thousands and thousands of votes, based apparently on a theory that you take the distance between Earth and the Moon, divide that by the number of people who have a Cuban sandwich in the afternoon. To come up with this number, because it's not, it's, it's. There's no other rationality right. for the silliness. Well, Jack, not even that. The Ilion case really politicized that part of the, you know, town as far as Miami in general. So, you know, those people were pissed off. So, like you said, I don't even know where those people even got that kind of information. That's insanity. Well, one of the th one of the great one of the great <laughs> ironies is that you see some of these experts yeah. have come down. Um, I had a recount later uh, in Virginia right. where the Republicans put on an astrophysicist uh, to explain why numbers work the way they do. And he used uh, the distance between asteroids uh, as his uh, theory. So it, it, it gets goofy. It's not, it's not that difficult. Um, and then one of the problems is in Miami-Dade, that, that, that became the center of activity. We had protests. Um, the, the Republicans were well organized. Right. Uh, they actually had people in, out on the street in costumes, um, the sore loser um, t-shirts. Uh, and that recount was on again, off again. The board was fairly weak. Um, they didn't have a good command of the process. Um, they were, they became afraid of the protesters and the, that recount in the county building uh, was on the 18th floor, big room, everyone could observe. Uh, they panicked a little bit and went upstairs to the 19th floor where the 
actual voting machines were. Then there's a little office where they could proceed to go through uh, the ballots. Well, two things happen. One, it's a slower process. And two, when uh, the Republican um, operatives found out that it had been moved um, to an upstairs room uh, while they were observers um, and people from both political parties, it wasn't open to the public. Uh, and the Brooks Brothers uh, rioters, and they were basically called that because they were aides right. um, to um, members of Congress. Almost all of them looked like they came out of prep school. Um, I think most of them had khaki pants, uh, Weegians, blue shirts, uh, all of them all buttoned down. Um, and they uh, stormed the uh, lobby on the 19th floor. And that further, um, I think, scared the electoral board in Miami-Dade. You were there, right? I was there. Right. I was there. I was in that room. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was chaotic. Um, we went back to the, to the 18th floor, but we were losing time. Yeah. And time was really the enemy uh, of the recount in the sense that uh, I think an artificial date had, had been set for when we had to be, re had to be resolved. Um, the court cases um, uh, chiseled away at the time. Uh, there were both federal cases and then there were state cases. There was a case be before uh, a judge in Leon County, uh, Judge Salas. Um, so we get, we get a perception at least of, of less than orderly behavior. And we, one of the things we wanted to do in, uh, particularly in um, Volusia early uh, and in Broward is to ha have a perception that this was business as usual, that this was, wasn't a circus, that this was a simple administrative process that we were going through, everything's under control. Was this from Gore himself that brought that information? Because I they framed it out in the movie that Jesse Jackson was down there getting all the Jewish people out there, count every vote, and they were trying to get people involved. And then it was told that Warren Christopher put an end to that, said, you know, we can't do this. So is that what you're talking about? It was, was that I'm true? Sort of, I sort of, there was, the, well, there was a big, I'm not sure where this came from. Sure. Um, but there was a big effort on Al Gore's part uh, in Palm Beach to get affidavits mm -hmm. uh, from people that said I was confused and I voted for someone uh, other than who I wanted to vote for. Um, the efficacy, the effectiveness of those affidavits is between zero and nothing. Um, how am I going to rob? How If you tell me you voted for the wrong person. Yeah. So, okay, I believe you, Rob. How am I going to find your ballot? How am I going to look at it? Um, that well, train not even going... just that. Everybody could say that, and they would, you know, create all this controversy like they wanted to. And I believe that's what the Republicans wanted to do well, with and, the and, Brooks and... Brothers by it, the costumes, and, like you said, Jack. Go ahead. Well, I agreed, and and we see a little bit of that yeah. uh, in post this election. Right. We see some of that with the with the. Um, with the allegations of fraud, the QAnon, uh, all of that, we see that we see the silliness yeah. <laughs> um, to undermine, and that, that get, I think the Republicans clearly had in mind undermine the recount effort. They had won uh, on election night and wanted to stick with the win. Um, I think at the higher levels, um, if you asked, they would have, of course deny that th that was their intent. Uh, and then we had the, the Supreme Court effort, which no one other than Ted Olson thought was going to be successful. The cardinal law school rule was elections are run at the state level. This isn't a federal que question. This isn't something that you get involved in uh, unless there is some uh, claim of, of racial um, impact. Um, the, right prim the white primary cases where uh, the Supreme Court said that the Democratic Party cannot exclude uh, people based on, uh, on race. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it gets to the Supreme Court once, and they basically send a message back to the, to the Florida Supreme Court. Um, this, you got to get your house in order. Uh, it's a little more technical than that, but that's what the message really was. Uh, and it was a, largely about the standards. The Florida Supreme Court, in essence, and no disrespect to the Supreme Court, sort of ignores the urgency of, of what the Supreme Court was, was asking. Recount continues. It does look like a somewhat of a circus at times, if not most times. It goes back up to the Court of Appeals. It, the case goes then to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And the most devastating part of the Supreme Court process is not the decision uh, that was rendered on December 12th. It is the stay that's entered on Saturday. And Justice Nino Scalia makes it pretty clear that he wants to stop the recount because what well, seems that his guy isn't going to win. Right. Um, that the conservative candidate Bush is might be in trouble. It doesn't. That's not what the stay says, but that's what I believe is really behind it. Um, I have the greatest respect for the late uh, uh, Justice uh, Nina Scalia. I had him for a class at, at law school. Worked with him in the American Bar Association. A very interesting guy. Very smart guy. But what that stay did is stopped a statewide recount because we'd gone through this whole process. And finally, the uh, Florida uh, local court said, we're gonna have a statewide recount. So we had assembled across uh, all of um, the counties, uh, a series of recounts. We actually brought the, um, Miami-Dade ballots um, to Tallahassee. And we're in the process of recounting the ballots when the stay came down, stopped the whole process. And once that happened, you had no chance of ever proving whether Al Gore could win or not. And the big mistake uh, conceptually, uh, and it's a mistake that I think was made in our advocacy before the Supreme Court, was to play into somewhat of that confusion. And here was the question. The question of the Supreme Court is, well, Mr. Boyce, doesn't, doesn't each table that's counting um, have the possibility of coming up with a slightly different standard? And the answer is, well, yes. The answer should have been, well, yes, but. Hmm. Every disputed ballot, which we're now gonna categorize as to how it was disputed, is going to go to a single arbiter. It's going to be a, a judge in Leon County. And Terry Lewis is the judge is going to decide uh, what standard uh, will apply so that ultimately we are applying a single standard to all ballots. It just happens that it goes through this kind of recount adjudicative process. No, and again, there's nothing wrong with developing a standard that way. But if that had been the answer, I'm not sure the Supreme Court would have had the same sense of total confusion. They were left with the view that that Table A was using one standard, Table B was using another standard. And that doesn't sit well right. uh, when you're trying to sort out who's going to be the next president of the United States. You want to have a uniform standard. That standard was was possible. But well, not with with the approach with and remember that at that time, you are correct, Rob. We had a Republican governor, somewhat somewhat interested in the outcome, um, because it was his brother. We have a legislature which is Republican, which had the Supreme Court not done in the recount. I think the legislature could have easily said, "Wait a minute." This recount is a mess. Um, it didn't work out the way it should have. Um, we're going to cast our electoral votes for Governor Bush um, of uh, Texas. Um, interestingly enough, 
take that recount experience, move to Georgia in 2020, mm. and you see a hand count that is done professionally. There's no questions, and there is no evidence whatsoever that the results in Georgia this time around aren't the exact right results. And that was a close election. Right. So it is possible to do these recounts. Uh, I think we learned a lot, not about how you recount ballots. That art hasn't changed uh, much, but we learned a lot about the politics of recounts and the Al Gore approach uh, was not a winning approach. Um, a lot of these allegations uh, of fraud are nonsensical. Um, sitting down and counting votes, machines have gotten better. Remember, punch cards was an answer from the 1950s um, because we thought that actually doing a hand count what was harder on workers and less reliable. Um, IBM creates a punch card and uh, we start using that. That technology uh, well past its time uh, by the 2000 election hadn't been maintained. Um, unfortunately, uh, older machines and less maintained machines showed up in uh, minority districts, um, places they shouldn't have been. Um, the technology wasn't there. Um, the expertise uh, on, a, on a local level wasn't what it should be. Um, and, you know, learning lessons is sometimes hard. Um, but we also, we also weren't spending a lot of time looking at ballots. Right. Um, uh, we, Virginia had, we had a different program in Virginia in the, in the late 80s um, and 90s, uh, in part arising out of a recount in 1989 for, um, for the first African-American governor. Doug um, Wilder. Yeah. Doug, L. Douglas Wilder. Yeah. Um, and we, we learned a lot from, from that about the politics, the politics of, of voting, which a lot of people didn't spend time on. We spend now a lot of time on it, sometimes an excessive amount of time on the politics of voting um, and not necessarily on the, on the politics of the process of voting uh, that is fair and equal. Uh, so we learned a lot of lessons from Florida um, you know, the press came in and did a, did a, uh, tried to recreate the recount. Right. Uh, wasn't particularly definitive one way or the other. Uh, tied elections are always tough. Um, the Supreme Court's one good uh, outcome was that um, they issued an opinion not particularly a, a great opinion, but an opinion that was acceptable to everyone, including the vice president. And the vice president um, was gracious enough, smart enough uh, in early December to concede on national TV. I think his finest moment uh, was that concession speech. I wish he had been that kind of politician uh, before the election. Jack Young, this was fascinating. I really enjoyed this, and I hope we can do this again down the road. For everybody listening again, Jack Young, he was hugely involved in the election of 2000. Definitely check this out and check more about him out. I'm sure he'll be involved in a lot of elections uh, to come. So, Jack, thanks so much. I appreciate this. It means a lot, seriously. Well, thank you, Rob. Anytime, right. anywhere, anytime. anytime. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll I'll you, definitely buddy. email you and we'll definitely do this again down the road in a few months or so. I Thanks so it. much, That's Jack. Right. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Yep.